uh, we're talking about very serious stuff. We've tried to mix not only what God's Word says, but also what's actually happening. And to conclude this little series that we've done on the coming war with Israel and the question, will Israel survive? We believe Israel will survive, but there's a great effort to delegitimize Israel in our world. Uh, you probably know that if you are watching the news. But remember that the, the news, even cable news like CNN or Fox News, uh, we don't worship at their feet. We worship at the feet of God's word. It's what the Lord God of Israel has to say that counts. And Israel is going to survive. Uh, the Bible even tells us in the New Covenant of Jeremiah 31, the covenant by which everyone is saved, a covenant that was given to Israel, by the way, and it's a covenant that God will take away our sin and never remember it against us anymore. The great issue that confirms that is that the nation of Israel will never cease to exist before me forever, said the Lord. But you either believe the Lord or you believe our current president. <laughs> or you believe Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood. Or you believe Ahmadinejad of Iran. Or you believe the United Nations, which just basically I like to call the United Nothing, because I don't believe they know what they're doing. All I know is that we're paying for it. And the truth is, we want to know, as Bible believers, what exactly does Israel now face? So we're going to try to tie this all together. Is there coming a war against Israel? Yes, there is. There's no doubt about it. In fact, there may be more than one. It's possible that Psalm 83 is speaking about a battle with Israel's immediate neighbors. That's a possibility. Psalm 83 says they're confederate with one another. They want to remove Israel from remembrance. Cut it off forever. Well, it isn't going to happen. Because the Lord God of Israel said they're not going to do it. The nation of Israel will never <coughs> cease to exist before me forever. You see, God's covenant with Israel is everlasting. By the way, that would have been a good time for you to say praise the Lord or amen or something. <laughs> yeah, because God says he's going to judge the silence of his people who do not speak up when he says something really good. So let me repeat again. The Lord God says the nation of Israel will never cease to exist before me forever. Amen. Okay, we're waking up. Take your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. Now we have studied 38 and 39. Ezekiel 37 is the prophecy about Israel becoming a nation in the end time, a resurrection. The dry bones will live again. And they will come into Eretz Israel, or the land of Israel. Now the wonderful promises of God are called covenants. Uh, if you have a Schofield Reference Bible, they have eight covenants. I have a problem with them. Why? Two of them are not called covenants. So if the Bible doesn't call it a covenant, neither do I. How about you? And they leave one out. The covenant of the Messiah is hardly mentioned by anybody, and that's the covenant in Isaiah 42, whereby the Gentiles will receive the gospel from the Messiah himself. It's a wonderful covenant. I don't know why people left it out. Every covenant has a sign. Let's see how you're doing. What's the first covenant in the Bible? Anyone? What's the first covenant in the Bible? Abrahamic. No. Somebody has guessed. No. Noah. That's the first covenant. God says he'll never destroy the world with a flood again. Which means the flood had to be global. It couldn't be local. Why? If it's local, then God's been lying. I don't want to be on that side. No, God caused a global deluge. What's the sign of that covenant? The rainbow. Hey, you're doing good. You scholars of the Bible. This is wonderful. What's number two? 
all of a sudden we've lost our biblical brain. What's number two? Oh, take a chance. Abraham, absolutely. Abraham's the most important covenant. Why? Because there are three parts to it. One is a nation that will never cease to exist. We got hundreds of preachers on television and radio saying that God canceled his everlasting covenant with Israel as a nation. Excuse me? If it's everlasting, then, and you believe it is no more, wouldn't that be an oxymoron? Uh, when Jesus said, I give you eternal life and you shall never perish, does that stop? Uh, if you've been born again, can you be unborn? If you have eternal life, does it ever end? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? It's everlasting. People say to me all the time, my preacher friends that don't agree with what I'm teaching, they will know when we get to heaven. But anyway, they say, well, that was in the law. That was in Genesis. I mean, we're long removed from that. Okay, let's go a thousand years away from that. And go to the time of King David, Psalm 105, verses 8 to 11. God says, I will remember my covenant forever. The covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that involves not only a nation, but a land. Let's go back to the Abrahamic covenant again. A nation, a land, and number three, a descendant who will bless the entire world, both Jew and Gentile. That's the Messiah. That's our Lord Yeshua. Amen? Amen. I'd say it loud if I were you. The, the truth of the matter is that's the most important covenant. And today we have evangelical Christians all over the place who of course want to believe in the descendant. That's the only way we can get saved. For salvation is truly of the Jews. But they don't want to deal with Israel as a nation or the land of Israel. By the way, the name of Israel, officially, is Eretz Israel. Eretz means land. The official name is Land of Israel. Have you noticed? They hardly ever mention the land. Why? Because they're trying to take the land away from Israel. Our own president, I could, I, I tell you, he, he bothers me so much. <coughs> Jerome Kersey wrote the book, Obama Nation. If you haven't seen it, it's worth getting. And uh, he advises you in the book to learn how to say the title of the book real fast. Let's try it. Abomination. An abomination? Why, that's a bad word in the Bible. Yes, abomination. 139 lies so far the president has told, many of them about Israel. And this week, just two days ago, Israel has no right to the land except the 1967 lines. You know, that only gave them nine miles along the Mediterranean? What is the matter with our president? Is he nuts? This is serious. Now, we got a problem in our election. I just want to clear this up for you. Uh, this world and what the Lord is doing in it is not about the election in November. Amen? Amen. Look how hesitant you are. Well, what's he going to say now, Martha? Hey, listen. I don't care whether we get Obama again or we get a Mormon. Mr. Romney's a Mormon. Now, he needs to get straightened out in some stuff. He seems like a nice man, moral man, good family. Uh, he's a businessman. Maybe he can get us out of the trouble we're in. I don't know. But he's got some problems. Uh, you know what Jerusalem is to Mr. Romney? It's Salt Lake City. What are you laughing about? It is Salt Lake City. That's the theology of Mr. Romney. Oh, but he is a friend of Netanyahu in Israel, and that may save the day for him. Oh, by the way, he believes that Satan is the brother of Jesus. Is everybody okay? You're looking at me funny now. Well, who do we vote for? <laughs> well, uh, you can do what I do. See, in California, you can write in your presidential candidate. I've been doing it for years. 
your vote for president, I write in my own candidate. I put Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, people say, well, if you keep doing that, you have no effect. I'm not so sure. Two months ago, before the Republican convention, I received a telephone call in which the Republican Central Committee wanted me to head up the delegation from California to Orlando. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And they said, well, you do it, won't you? I said, no, I don't want to step down. <laughs> step down? I said, well, yes, the highest calling is to teach the Bible. You guys need to get back to the Bible just as surely as the Democrats do. Amen? Amen. So you say, who do we vote for? Well, I, I can't help it if you in Hawaii have to pick one. You got two evils, pick the one that might be the less trouble. Okay? You say, is this a political talk? No. It's a talk about the Bible. But you see, the Bible affects all political issues. Oh, it's funny. You're absolutely silent. What are you, scared to death? God's listening. Every single issue they call political is in the Bible. Amen. What is the matter with us? Okay. So, Israel is uh, under the Abrahamic Covenant. And it involves a nation that will never cease to exist. It involves a land that God says is my land. Leviticus 25, 23. He owns it. Islam doesn't own it. God owns it. And he has given it to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? Amen. Well, that was weak, but <laughs> it, it'll have to do, I guess. So, before you leave today, there are two books that you need to get. One is about Jerusalem. Small little book, very inexpensive. But it has details, facts in it you will not see anywhere else. Jerusalem has been attacked and destroyed over 44 times. There are details in here that are amazing. It tells you all the prophecies about Jerusalem. Oh, it also tells you that Jerusalem is not one of Islam's holy cities. They made it up when Israel became a nation in 1948. You want to witness to a Muslim and really get them ticked off? I'm not saying you're trying to tick them off, but it really will when you tell them how come Jerusalem is not in the Quran if it's your holy city? Well, they'll say, you've got to know Arabic. It's, it's Arabic name is El Quds. Your next statement? How come it's never called El Quds in the Quran either? Their next statement will be, well, it's probably not very often mentioned in the Bible. Wrong! over a thousand times by its different names. That will make them so mad, they will then get up and say, al -Akbar, al -Akbar, al -Akbar, which basically means I'm going to kill you if I can. <laughs> oh, by the way, those of you who are listening now and think we don't love Muslims, you're crazy. We're seeing many come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You do not win anybody in the Middle East, Jew or Muslim, if you don't not know how to argue and to be sweet at it. Amen? Can you smile right now? Amen? Tell them you're going to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. Can you do it? It's not easy. But you see, we need to know the facts. So many Christians don't know the facts about Jerusalem. Get the book and also our brand new book called Israel Chosen by God. It is now being translated into Hebrew, and uh, we've made arrangements for it to be printed and distributed in Israel by an Israeli company. There will be copies given to the entire Knesset and all the cabinet of Israel, including Mr. Netanyahu. So pray for it, if you will, at least. And uh, those are there. People asked me in the last session, what other books about Israel or the Messiah do you recommend? I recommend this for sure. The Messiah of Israel. It is the book of Hebrews. Written to Jewish people to explain all that I'm trying to do today and can't, don't do such a good job doing. Uh, this is the book to get. The Messiah of Israel. And you will find all of that which we are saying and much more 
because the answer is the Messiah, as you will soon see. Now, you've got your Bible open, Ezekiel 36. Let's start at verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen, the word heathen is goyim in Hebrew, a goy is a Gentile, goyim, plural, Gentiles. It's translated heathen, it's translated nations, and it's translated peoples, and it's translated Gentiles, one Hebrew word. Probably the word nations would be the best. I'll take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into the land that all the Turks own. No. I'll bring you to the land that belongs to Iran. No. I'll bring you into what? What does it say? Your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your what? The fathers. There's a whole chapter in the book I've written on Israel, chosen by God, about the fathers. It is referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God gave the land to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And nothing has changed. Ye shall be my people, I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses. I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that you shall receive no more reproach of famine among the nations. Then shall you remember your own evil ways, your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I do this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded. The desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that pass by, and they shall say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. And all God's people said, Amen. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem or Jerusalem in her solemn feast. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Listen, folks, Ezekiel is one of the most important prophecies in the Bible. Why? Seventy times in that one book, it says, and you shall know that I am the Lord. By what happens in the future? Now, quick review. Is there coming a war in the Middle East against Israel? Yes. Absolutely. We studied that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Many nations will be along the ones that are mentioned. The first nation is Persia or Iran. The force behind all this invasion is Gog of Magog. The prince of Rosh Meshach and Tubal. There's no doubt about it. Historical documentation has it as Russia. And Russia, by the way, just told the United States to get out of the Middle East. We're going to take it over. Valimar Putin used to run the KGB. They had 6,500,000 agents. Today, they have only 3 million, he said. What happened? 
500,000 Russian agents of the KGB. Well, Israel knows a lot about them. They have invaded Israel. The Russian mafia is very strong in Israel. They are so strong that in some cities, they've not even bothered to make the people speak Hebrew or to put the names of Hebrew names on it, on the signs. They are Russian. Russia is the second language now in Israel. The Russian mafia is creating a monstrosity for Israel. Tel Aviv, where they operate, is listed by the United Nations as the most wicked city of the world of 500,000 people or more. Did you hear that? Tel Aviv, Israel, in wickedness per capita, is the most wicked city of the world. 50 miles away is another city that has over 500,000, in fact, has close to 800,000 now, and that's Jerusalem. And in all the lists of all the cities of the world of 500,000, the one at the bottom with the fewest amount of wickedness is Jerusalem. Tell me the most wicked, and way down the list, Jerusalem, the least wicked of all cities of 500,000. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So what is Israel facing now? That's the question. Very important question, because as we learned last night, contrary to a lot of prophecy teachers like myself, contrary to many who said that the rapture will take us out before any trouble on the planet, according to Luke 21 and Matthew 24 and Mark 13, we are going to still be here, believers, in what is called the birth pangs, the beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24, 8. What are the birth pangs? It says of a woman travailing in pain. That is the number one illustration of the tribulation period in all the Hebrew prophets and also in Paul's writing. He says, you yourselves, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in, in the night. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. What's it talking about? The baby coming out of the woman in the illustration is the tribulation period called the day of the Lord. Has three sets of judgments in it. Seven seal. Seven trumpets, seven bulls of wrath, the most horrible time on planet Earth ever in the history of the world, caused by God himself. Well, before the baby comes out of the womb, as it were, there's going to be birth pains. Jesus said, wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes in various places you didn't expect. Pestilences and plagues are going to get increased in the world. If you're a little confused on this, go to the website, the Center of Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, as we mentioned last night, and you will see that we have more diseases now than the world has ever even thought of. In terms of sexual disease, there's now 126 strains of it. Eight of them are epidemic levels, of which AIDS is only one. What's going on? We now have the worst cases of E. coli and malaria that the world's ever seen. Those female mosquitoes are getting immune and they're causing more trouble. Thousands have died in Central Africa. Two out of every three babies never makes it in life in Central Africa. They need clean water, they need medicines, they need good food, that's true. But you see the plagues are running rampant. Jesus said famines. We got all excited about famine. Remember that, the 60-40 window around the globe? Whatever happened to all that? Well, first of all, we didn't deliver the goods because of the Somali Islamic pirates who took it away from the people. <coughs> famine is worse now than ever before. There are more people dying of malnutrition because of famine than ever in the history of the world. When are we going to wake up? Are we seeing unbelievable global 
catastrophes and diseases. Oh yeah. And earthquakes in diverse places. I went to Cal Institute of Technology at Berkeley to find out what the truth was. And you too can go on the web and find out about it. There are more earthquakes occurring that are recorded than we have ever had in recorded history. Last year alone, over 500,000 earthquakes. Well, they don't even put them in the news unless they're about, uh, you know, on the Richter scale of five and above. But the truth is, what one of the men at Caltech said, he said, it looks like somebody has picked the planet up and is shaking it. Excuse me, that's in the Bible. In Isaiah 13, God says, I'm going to shake the world. And they will have fear. There will be panic among them. And the truth is, we're seeing earthquakes hitting all over the world. And the scientists are confused because we thought they only happen in the faults. Wrong. They're happening in areas that are not a fault line. And why are we saying all this? Because we've been hiding, as it were, from the obvious point of our Lord that the birth pangs of this woman is going to bring forth a baby, the Holocaust of Terror, known as the day of the Lord, the day of God's vengeance. There will be things leading up to it. And Jesus names them. Will Israel survive? Yes. They won't think they will. They're going to cry out to God. Lord, we're cut off for our parts. Have you forgotten your covenant to us? It looks like it's all over. Jerusalem's going to be taken. Half the city will go into captivity. The women are going to be raped. The children are going to be killed. The blood's going to flow to the horses' bridles. And the Messiah is the only one that can bring hope. Wow. That was a quick review in case you weren't here. So, what does this world face right now? Great question. You got a pencil? Pen? Here are seven things to answer this question. I just came from this world. It was there 17 days. We watched as people in major stores put in gas masks with their groceries. Why? Because in Israel, they're afraid of their enemies. They know what they can do. They know the rockets and the missiles they have. And then to think nuclear weapons? Wow. So, number one. Israel's economy is strong and growing. You say, that sounds like a positive. That, according to the Bible, is what is going to be true when all hell breaks out. Traffic is becoming a major problem in Israel. They're adding over 150,000 cars every single year. They don't have room for them. You talk about growth. For the first time, the United Nations at the General Assembly here a couple of weeks ago announced, which they do every year, the nations that are growing the most, that are financially the most prosperous. Number one was Israel, much to the shock of all the 74 Islamic delegates. Israel's number one. Their growth is in the high-tech area. It's no longer in San Francisco. Silicon Valley is now in Israel. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have seen to it, putting millions of dollars into it. You talk about Windows Live 7, and now 8 is supposed to come out after the first of the year. Where does that come from? It comes from Israel's technology. Israel's not only great in uh, the high-tech arena, but also in medicine and in pharmaceuticals. Frankly, the entire world is dependent now upon Israel from a health point of view because the pharmace pharmaceutical industry in Israel is producing the medicines that are helping diseases all around the world. Israel is strong and growing, but don't get too excited about that. According to the Bible, that's what is going to be true, and they're going to think because of it the world would never attack, attack us. But we learned Friday night 
That's one of the reasons the world is going to attack Israel. To get a financial reward and a spoil out of the whole process. Number two, Israel's environment is suffering from five years of drought. Why do they have that drought? And the answer is very clear in the Bible. When you turn your back on the Lord God of Israel, and you don't depend upon him, but rather upon your own skills, one of the things God's going to bring is a drought. It's not going to rain like it used to. When I was down at the Dead Sea, staying at the beautiful La Meridian, did you know I could walk straight across the Dead Sea? Walk straight across the Dead Sea. It has dried up so much. Did you know the Sea of Galilee is already down at a level that's not safe anymore? And 15% of that water goes to Jordan as well? The whole Middle East is concerned. They don't have the water they need. Israel's very concerned. Let's go to a third matter that's most serious, and that's Israel's endurance of world pressure about a Palestinian state and an Arab capital in East Jerusalem is wearing thin. Why does Israel not trust our current president? Because he is saying things about this that is troubling indeed. He wants East Jerusalem to be a capital of the Palestinians. Interesting, in all the Arab uh, polling, and by the way, there's over a million Arabs who are full citizens of Israel. 99% of them don't want to live in a new Palestinian state controlled by Islam. They want to stay with Israel. We got a problem developing. Let me tell you a couple things about it real quick. The proposals for peace are seductive and disastrous and they will only be temporary at best. Ezekiel 13, read verses 1 to 16. God calls them foolish prophets. They, they, they believe vanity, soap bubbles. They're not telling people the truth. They're lying about peace. Peace when there is no peace, the Bible says. The only one who can bring peace is who? Number two, the person who will bring eternal peace is the Messiah of Israel. Excuse me? I didn't hear anybody say anything. Amen. Now let's learn to say amen every time we hear something about God or about the Messiah that's good. Amen? amen? Okay. There never will be any peace until the Messiah comes. Amen. I don't know. You're all right, but you're a little sleepy. Number four. Israel's enemies are preparing for war. Is this Psalm 83? It could be. Psalm 83 says that Israel's immediate neighbors are, in fact, confederate with one another on one issue, to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. You know, I appreciate all the time how the Lord gives me illustrations of what I'm going to preach on. I got one yesterday. Mr. Nasrallah, who is the head of Hezbollah in Lebanon, came out yesterday and said, we are going to attack the Galilee. The Galilee belongs to us. Israel now has a huge force up in the Galilee at the northern border. We don't trust Hezbollah. They've been financed by Iran. They have over 80,000 rockets and missiles, some with chemical warheads. And they are the ones helping Bashar Assad to kill his own people. They, along with the Republican guards, over 3,000 of them, who come from Iran. I like what one writer said. He's a very excellent writer. His name is David Dolan. CBS correspondent for 30 years in Jerusalem, well respected. He has a report every month. And if you don't remember to do this, to look at his site, you can go to our website, davidhockey.org, because every month it comes out, I put it also on our site. And you can download it, and you will have more knowledge about the Middle East than the average person you work and live with. David Dolan. 
will tell you what the problems are. We went up to the border of Syria, by the way. We were told by the company, don't go up there. You know, they have a war. So what? I've been in Israel in a time of war. It's kind of fun. So I took our 78 members up. They said, well, well, I don't think we should go up there. You know, it's dangerous. Well, you can stay in a hotel, but I'm going. By the way, all 78 of them went. Scared to death. We were up on the Golan Heights. They said, well, this is enough. Let's go back. I said, no. We're going to go over the Syrian border and take a look at it. So we did. And those United Nations guys, aren't they cute? They have little light blue berets, and they're supposed to be monitoring. They don't do anything. The Syrians walk right by them and laugh at them. Oh, they don't want you to know that, by the way. So you're supposed to be very thrilled that the United Nations is at all these strategic places. Are you kidding? They never do anything. Totally helpless. Well, Israel sitting here at the border, we already have thousands of Syrian refugees, precious people, who even Israel said most of them are Christians. Yes, Syria had Christians all over it, including in Damascus, one of the oldest cities of the world. Remember the Apostle Paul there in the book of Acts? There are still believers there. And these precious people are begging Israel, let us in. Well, they can't do that or they're going to have a real serious problem. So you know what Israel's done? They bring Mogan David, which is their Red Cross. And they bring food, water, and medicines to all these precious people. And they say, we're sorry. We wish we could take you in, but we can't do it right now. Unbelievable what's happening. This world faces war on every hand. And now Egypt? Morsi, the new president, the head of the Muslim government. Oh, by the way, if you folks do not get HFT Connect, you need to. Write a note to yourself right now. Take out your pen, pencil. Come on, some of you just staring at me like, uh. No, get your pencil and your pen right out. HFT Connect. Here's what you do. You go on our website, davidhocking.org, and you will see a little box on the front, on the right, HFT Connect. Just click it on, and all you have to do is put in your email, and every week you get a special controversial e-letter from us. And I'll tell you what you're going to see coming up in the next week. The United States Christians are so ignorant over the Muslim Brotherhood, they have organizations like Chrislam and Palestinian Christianity, et cetera, et cetera. They are all fronts of Islamic terror. And so the truth about the Muslim Brotherhood will be on that HFT Connect, including their involvement in the United States, which has been here since 1958. And including the man who's the head of it, who our own president says is a wonderful friend. No, he's not. He's an assassin, a murderer, and a killer. And the true story about him will also be on that. As you can see, there are a lot of people in this world that don't like people like me. Amen? But see, I'm old and senile now. So I really don't care what you say. The truth will set you free. Amen? Amen. We need to know the truth and not be afraid of it. I, I love to witness these people. I look at them straight in the eye. Muslim Brotherhood guys. All of them are graduates of Harvard or Yale. They all wear beautiful suits and silk ties and magly shoes. And all of them have their beards shaved beautifully. And they look great. They're not like your average terrorist. That's why you don't understand them. And they're everywhere. Oh, by the way, there's 57 of them employed by Obama in our own government.
Do you know that woman who they say is the power behind Obama? No, not Susan Rice. She's about ready to be kicked out. Valerie Jarrett. Been with him a long time. You know, she's a big wig in the Muslim government called Muslim Brotherhood. She's the head of the women's division. Did you know that the right hand to Hillary Clinton in our State Department is the head, current head, of the Women's Department of the Muslim Brotherhood? A brotherhood that calls the U.S. Satan and has to be destroyed. Their goal is to destroy the United States of America by 2025. They intend to take over Europe by 2020. And they just recently said they're right on schedule. The Muslims are taking over France right now. They got so many now. They got rid of the man who was more pro-Israel, Sarkozy. And they have another one now who's really sympathetic. Do you know what's happening in the world? You say, well, we live in the Hawaiian Islands. Come on, man. Aloha. <laughs> Excuse me, did you know that Hezbollah and Hamas have agents here in the Hawaiian Islands? And there's nothing they would love any better than to blow up Pearl Harbor again? Hello. Are you guys still with me? You see, number five, Israel's encouragement from its allies is dwindling. Um, I study this all the time. You'd be amazed at the articles that Israel is writing about the undermining of Israel in the United States cabinet, government, and administration. It's dangerous what's happening. And number six, Israel's efforts to combat world criticism and condemnation needs to intens intensify. Why? Jesus said, Matthew 24, 9, you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. There is only one nation in the United Nations that always votes for Israel. Who is it? No, I'm sorry. It's not the United States. Micronesia. I don't know what they're doing down there, but I think we should all move. Micronesia is the most pro-Israel nation on the face of the planet. Incredible. Now we have Canada. Canada is being blessed because its current prime minister is pro-Israel, Mr. Stephen Harper. And he is a blessing. And Obama can't stand him. Mr. Harper recently told him at the G20 conference, when Obama told Harper, you have vetoed every single issue here about Israel. He said, well, what you need to do, Obama, is to read the Bible. That's what's wrong with you. When he rebuffed Mr. Netanyahu, do you know what Stephen Harper did in Canada? I don't even know if any of you knew this, because I've read your papers. You are being blackened out from the news of the world, let me tell you, here in Hawaii. You need to get on the internet and find out what's going on. But the truth of the matter is, Canada's more pro-Israel than ever, and they have severed all relationships with Iran. They just did. Cut off all connections with the Muslim Brotherhood. And Stephen Harper said, we're going to follow the Lord God of Israel here in Canada. That's why God is blessing Canada. Their dollar is now worth more than ours. Amen? Amen. I don't know. I have a hard time saying amen because I'm going to Canada this week. I have a conference there. And uh, our dollar is nine cents worthless by comparison to Canadian dollar. Canada is being blessed because the Prime Minister is pro-Israel. Wow. 
Are you all excited? What do we care about Canada? This is Hawaii. Well, you should care. I understand Canada is now the owner of many, many construction projects, Charlie. Canada. They're moving around the world. And God is blessing them because they're pro-Israel now with Mr. Harper. Oh, we got one more point. Are you ready? Israel's expectancy and hope for the future centers more and more upon the promised coming of the Messiah. Netanyahu spoke to the Knesset recently and said those exact same words. He spoke on the voice of Israel. It was a Hebrew program and an English program. I love to listen to him. His speeches in front of our Congress and the UN were absolutely amazing. He came back home and all the Israeli people are wondering now, what are you going to do? And he gets on the voice of Israel, which goes over the whole country, and he says, in my opinion, there's only one hope for us, and that's the Lord God of Israel and his promised Messiah. I got so excited, but there was nobody around. I was listening late at night by myself. So I had to jump and scream, and nobody was there. Wow, praise the Lord! Nobody was there to talk to, so I'm talking to you. Amen? Amen. Aren't you excited? Yes. <laughs> Aren't you excited? Yes. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, we're in Hawaii. Praise the Lord. Aloha, mahalo, amen. Wait a minute. A lady asked me here an interesting question. I don't see her this morning. But she said, what can an individual like me do? This is kind of hopeless. We're listening to you, and what can we do? I said, I want you to know that God saves by few, not by many. It doesn't take a whole lot of people. We don't need a mass sign-up crusade. No, we need you as an individual to stand up for Israel. You'll never know how important that is until you say so in public. Whether it's at the grocery store, the gas station, or some local meeting, or a school board, the fact is people are not speaking up. The Christians are going into hiding like, well, you know, the rapture's coming. We're going to be out of here. Excuse me? The birth pangs are coming. And they may have already started. I don't know. I believe we're on the threshold of the return of the Lord. That's what I believe. I would not be surprised that the Lord comes back. No! <laughs> we welcome some of you back to the service. <laughs> The Bible says in an hour that you think not. If I asked you how many of you believe that the Lord is coming in 12 noon, well, you know, he could, but I don't really. Well, if you don't believe it, that he's coming in 12 noon, then maybe he is. Because in an hour that you think not, he's coming. A dear lady who supports our ministry said to me, David, the older you get, the more I worry. I said, what? She said, there aren't many people that will stand up for Israel anymore. She said, my own pastor used to, but he doesn't anymore. It's like people don't want to care. Exactly what the Bible predicts is going to happen is happening right now. We're being deceived lulled to sleep, as it were. And some of us act like it's no big deal. Yes, it is a big deal. I want to take as many men and women and boys and girls to heaven with me. How about you? Amen? Amen. Amen. So we got to open our mouths and stop being silent. I hear this all the time. And I know you do, but sometimes we've blocked our ears so we don't hear it, or we, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to stand up and say anything. Jesus is coming. Amen. Amen. 